neuroanatomy. So totally in neuroanatomy, we will have five classes, five or six classes. In about uh, 18 to 19 hours, we will say we are strong in neuroanatomy. That should be our confidence level. Let us take some common questions which are all asked on the topic of meninges and CSF is going to be our next important topic uh, of review. <clears throat> meninges, you all know pad. Pia, innermost, arachnoid, in the middle, then is the dura. Pia and arachnoid are basically called leptomeninges is what need to be remembered. <clears throat> Very good. We invite uh, Dr. Usha and uh, Nina, Jabalpur, Raipur, very good. None of them have run away in spite of it being neuroanatomy. Huh? No problem. Now, doctor, <clears throat> after this uh, meninges topic is over, we will take up the quiz. I know your brain can still accommodate some more facts. Anatomy is a compendium of facts, but those facts make a lot of difference. So ultimately understand neurology or any part of the medicine. Now, doctor, pia and arachnoid are called leptomeninges. Now, what is pia? Pia is that highly vascular connective tissue, very delicate in nature, and it closely covers the surface of the brain and the spinal cord. Directly abutting onto the brain and the spinal cord is the pia matter, highly vascular. Denticulate ligaments are the structures we need to know in relation to pia. What are they? The pile tissue typically become flattened and form band like structures which are called as denticulate ligaments. Typically, these denticulate ligaments will adhere to the spinal dura matter. Between pia and dura, they form 21 locations may attachments. So, they are the condensed band like structures connecting the pile tissue with the dura and uh, what is phylum terminal after all? Phylum terminal also is a modified form of a pile tissue only. It is a non-neural band of tissue which is a condensation of the pile matter it is the phylum terminal and uh, it basically extends from the conus medullaris which is the tip of the spinal cord and it will be extending down to the end of the dural sac and it will be fusing with that. So that's what, uh, that's how the spinal cord will be ending. Spinal cord will be ending and pilum terminal will continue down which is a pile tissue extension. It will be ending into a dural sac. Now, what is arachinoid? Arachinoid is a non-vascular connective tissue which is also once more delicate which is embedded between the dura out, pia in, in the middle is Arachinoid. Arachinoid need to be remembered because of the granulations which are also called arachinoid villi. What is the significance? Typically, arachinoid villi will permit the CSF to flow in only one direction. One direction from the subarachinoid space into the venous circulation. They offer a way to suck them and drain into the venous circulation. That is the main function of these arachinoid granulations. And uh, if you take the various venous sinuses, highest number of arachinoid granulations will be found in the superior sagittal sinus. Okay, doc? So, this is how you have the arachinoid granulations. What is their role, doctor? They basically will suck the CSF and make them unidirectionally to flow into the venous sinuses is what I want to underscore to all of you. Now, dura matter, the outermost layer, purely connective tissue and uh, favorite question of the examiner, dura is there everywhere, wherever the brain is there. So, you can divide the dura into that part which is above the tentorium cerebellum and which is below the tentorium. So, Supratentorial dura is supplied by trigeminal nerve, 
infratentorial that means the dura which is there in the posterior uh, cranial fossa it is supplied by vagus and the upper spinal nerves this one very fine question which is frequently asked by the examiner which you have to be very sure emphatically to answer what it is then what is meant by false cerebri between the two cerebral hemispheres the modification of the dura which is uh, typically located in the longitudinal cerebral fissure that means like a cabbage if you separate the two cerebral hemispheres then both of them are separated by this dural partition which is then called as false cerebra basically what does false cerebra contain it typically contains the superior sagittal sinus inferior sagittal sinus along uh, its both uh, edges is what you have to basically remember then what is the importance of tentorium cerebelli so basically there is a partition in the you remember our anatomy osteology class where professor brings the first time calvarium and shows beta isko bolte hai crinoid process this part is called anterior this is called middle cranial fossa and here you see foramen magnum this is all posterior fossa right so those days won't come back you need to travel 5 years i need to travel 2 decades to go back to the same level of innocence to understand the things but now tentorium cerebelli separates the posterior cerebral posterior cranial fossa from that of the middle cranial fossa and it separates the cerebellum and infratentorial brain stem which is in the posterior fossa from that of the temporal and occipital lobes also so that is the purpose of uh, tentorium cerebelli so middle cranial fossa with the posterior cranial fossa structures and within posterior cranial fossa the telencephalic structures from that of the structures of the hind brain so what are the structures of the telencephalon the temporal and occipital lobes it, they, they are separated from the cerebellum and infra tempo in infra tentorial part of the brain stem they are separated by this tentorium cerebelli additionally middle cranial fossa and the posterior cranial fossa structures are also separated by the tentorium cerebelli so it is that an extensive chambers now it basically contains a incisure through which the brain stem will be passing then we have one more important structure which is called diaphragm cella you know very well it forms the roof of that hypophyseal fossa pituitary gland and it contains an aperture through which the infundibulum pituitary stalk will be passing and it will be ultimately connecting with hypothalamus so from hypothalamus all your uh, um uh, uh vasopressin and all they will be passing through the blood vessels of this infundibular stalk and they will be ultimately reaching the posterior pituitary which is sitting in the pituitary fossa otherwise called hypophyseal fossa right doctor so that is being covered by one diaphragm that fossa pituitary fossa which is called diaphragm cellae then that is all the story that you need to know now what are the various dural sinuses venous sinuses dural sinuses are those endothelium lined valveless venous blood channels thank god they are valveless otherwise there is a varicose veins in the leg the varicose veins in the brain that would have complicated the whole situation in a very big way then we have few meningeal spaces we will talk about the dural venous sinuses in the next topic that is in the circulation of the brain and the spinal cord now what are the various meningeal spaces that you need to remember very simple between brain and the pia there is no space luckily there is no subpial space pia and arachnoid then between arachnoid and uh, dura and between dura and the bone epidural space subdural space subarachnoid space right so these are all the things that you need to 
we are go now going to pass through. Now let us look at these meningeal spaces starting from spinal cord. In the spinal cord, we have a spinal epidural space. Between what and what, doctor? Between the vertebral periosteum and the spinal dura. It contains loose areolar tissue, it contains lymphatics, venous plexuses, all these structures are located in this uh, area which is called as spinal epidural space. Why is it important, doctor? You can inject an anesthetic into it. If you inject an anesthetic into it, since it has got a lot of areolar tissue, venous plexus, lymphatics, there is a good chance of that being absorbed. And ultimately it will go and block the nerves. So what is that called as? Paravertebral nervous block. It is nothing but injecting uh, the anesthetic into the spinal epidural space is what we have to ultimately remember. Similarly you have an epidural space in the cranium between periosteum and the um, meningeal dura. So it contains mainly meningeal arteries and veins. So if there is any bleeding which occur into this epidural space means it is not venous bleeding. It is the arterial bleeding which bleeds into the epidural space in the cranial location. So epidural hematoma is predominantly arterial. Subdural hematoma is basically venous is what we have to remember. Then what is subdural space? Between the brains, dura and the arachnoid you have got subdural space and uh, its importance is very very significant because you have the superior cerebral veins and a superior sagittal sinus, venous sinus. Between the two you have bridging veins. Those bridging veins between superior cerebral vein and the superior sagittal sinus will be passing through subdural space. Any laceration of this bridging veins will lead to a bleed into the subdural space which is then called as subdural hematoma. Why it is more common in the old people? Once we become elderly then the brain shrinks. When the brain shrinks then what will happen? The distance between the superior sagittal sinus on the dura and the superior cerebral vein on the brain, this bridging vein becomes stretched and it will be torn and the bleed occurs into the subdural space. Hence, it is more common in the elderly people with a shrunken brain, with the stretching of the bridging veins. But if you look at the epidural hematoma, there is a history of trauma. That significant trauma tears the artery and that lead to bleeding into epidural space. But subdural may no history of trauma. No history of trauma. Maybe India won cricket match. Grandpa is very happy. So she has shaken the granny ma in full excitement. And uh, from next day onwards granny ma forgot about grandpa. Why? Because that shaking led to... Uh, Subdural hematoma, which commonly presents as dementia. Of course, it doesn't happen next day only. After a few days, she will start forgetting the grandpa. Then, subarachnoid space. It is between the pia overlying the brain and the arachnoid. And it contains the CSF. That's the reason we need to remember. It surrounds the entire brain and also the spinal cord. Subarachnoid space. And uh, it extends until the conus medullaris until the level of the second sacral vertebrae um, is what need to be basically remembered with regard to the subarachnoid space. Until where will spinal cord will be ending? L1 in the adults. Whereas your subarachnoid space will be extending below the cordus medullaris until the level of Second sacral vertebra, which is then called lumbar system, basically. So basically, whenever you are doing a spinal tap and you are taking out the CSF sample as a house surgeon, you are putting the needle not into epidural, not into subdural, but into subarachnoid space to take out the 
CSF out as a tag. Now, what are subarachnoid systems? The subarachnoid space which is containing the CSF has dilatation in few locations, which are then called systems. Depending upon wherever it is located, it is being named according to that underlying structure. See, if you look at the subarachnoid space, it is throughout everywhere around the brain, extending its spinal cord. So, you have a pontine system, chiasmatic system, interpedicular system. It all depends upon or subarachnoid space ke niche jo bhi structure hai unke naam pe unko cistern bolte cistern is nothing but dilatation of the subarachnoid space is what you have to basically remember 